All right, here we go. Decentralized Pictures Talent Cast. I'm Matt. That's Kelly Yu, writer, director of Plumtown and a winner of the DCP Short Film Award. Thanks for being here, Kelly. Thanks for having me, Matt. I'm so excited. Absolutely. So uh, so let's let's jump right in. Well, actually, before we do that, for those that are joining us on Twitter, uh, please, uh, please follow Decentralized Pictures. And for those of us that may be watching on YouTube, please smash that like and subscribe button so you can be informed uh, of, of events, cool events like this and other things happening with Decentralized Pictures. So let's jump right in. That's my preamble, Kelly. Well, let's talk mm-hmm. about you. So, so give us a little background about yourself and your history of being a filmmaker. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, hey, everybody. My name is Kelly Yu, and I'm a writer director based in LA. Um, And yeah, I guess um, I am originally from New Orleans. Um, I was born, well, I was born in Sweden um, and then moved to New Orleans um, and actually wasn't raised on film. Um, My parents, I think, watch like two movies a year. Um, And it's it's interesting because I was always um, drawn to the creative arts as a child. I'm an only child. Um, And so I actually growing up like loved writing. Um, I think I wrote like fiction novels in my backyard Um, (laughs) that actually now I read back like, oh, this is just like Harry Potter fan fiction that I thought was original. Um, And I grew up playing um, uh, classical music. I did violin, I did piano. Um, And then in high school, when it came time to, I went to an arts high school and it was like, pick like a concentration that you go down. Um, I was kind of at this crossroads about like, do I do orchestra, which is like what I've known all my life? Or do I do this new thing, which was at the time, I think called like media arts. And that was like photography, videography, film. Um, And I decided to do that because it seemed to me like this um, combination of everything that I've grown up loving. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I got introduced to the world of filmmaking. And, um, when it came time to college applications, I just going to film school made the most sense to me because I, I had fallen in love with this visual, this method of visual storytelling, which was, yeah, the combination of everything I love, which is music, photography, writing. Um, and yeah, so I, uh, went to USC film school, um, actually just graduated last week, um, and during my time there, I uh, wrote a feature called Plum Town based on my grandfather's true story of losing his uh, kind of like farmland, countryside land to a factory. Um, and yeah, my sophomore year, I crowdfunded the short film and shot it. And here we are. And just on this wild, crazy journey called filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to talk a lot more about the the, the, the craziness, the wildness of, of filmmaking and, and dive uh, more into uh, you being a student at USC and then obviously uh, details on Plumtown. So before we do it, uh, we'd like to show the uh, the audience a little trailer. So Plumtown, directed and written by Kelly Yu. We'll be right back. You're going to talk 爸你为啥还留在那儿工业化是将来必然的发展趋势农业已经没有前途了那你准备像别人一样把你老爸弄到工厂里头去儿子你爸没事我有我的电视机没有卡拉 All right. So Plum Town, written, again, written and directed by Kelly Yu. Um, I really enjoyed personally watching watching this short. And congratulations again on, on being the winner of the DCP Short yeah. Film Award. Obviously, very deserving, uh, brilliantly shot, brilliantly acted. Um, I love, personally love the score, beautiful score. And uh, it has a... Uh, uh, a lot of different themes, a lot of different themes happening here. So tell us more about Plum Town and, and your inspiration for, for bringing this story to life and the, uh, the personal connection behind this story. Totally. Um, so like I previously mentioned growing up, you know, in America being first generation, my parents are Chinese immigrants. Um, I never really knew my relatives, knew like kind of my family history. They all live in China. And um, I visited, I think as a kid and, you know, was too young to really like 
understand the importance of connecting to my heritage. Um, and my father, on my father's side, especially, my dad comes from generations of farmers in the countryside. Um, he's the only one in his family to have gone to college, to have left the countryside, like only one in his family to have immigrated to America. So I remember, I think I was 12. And then he was like, okay, we're going to China and you are going to live at your grandpa's village for two weeks. Um, and I remember pulling up and it was literally like the dirt countryside. Like he lived in like a hut and I was just like so miserable and I was like kicking and screaming. I wanted to live in uh, with my other grandpa who like lived in the city in a condo. Um, and that was kind of just my earliest memory of, of um, being there and, and getting to know my grandpa. And so obviously like stayed there for two weeks and went back to America and resumed my life here um, and kind of just forgot, forgot about, you know, that side of my family. Um, when I was there though as a kid i do the only thing i do remember is that my um relatives on that side are farmers and i would watch them wake up super early in the morning and go to the fields and that was i think something like i just clocked in my brain i was like okay that's what they do and um yeah i came back to america and years passed and uh after my high school graduation in 2019 i went back to china again um and visited my grandpa and i remember this time driving into the countryside i vividly just saw it was all these farmers that were still selling all their like goods their vegetables on the side of the street which is like how they make their li livelihoods um but so now china's just grown and changed exponentially and it's it's now like a virtually cashless uh society everyone kind of just does like electronic kind of like um apple pay so like nobody uses cash anymore and so all these farmers just had like uh, plastic QR codes on the side of the street. Um, they were trying to, you know, appeal to this new cashless system. And it just looked like two different worlds just like stuck in time, you know, like the past, like just these farmers hanging on to tradition, but still like trying to, um, innovate and embrace, embrace change to survive. Um, and I remember asking my uncle, I was like, how's farming? It was the only like common topic that I had with them. And he looks at me and he's just like, oh, we don't do that anymore. Um, a few years ago, a Korean like smartphone corporation came in and made us an offer to buy our best land. And we agreed. And now they uh, built a factory there and we work in the factory. And he was like, it's, you know, this, it gave us a stable income. It raised our like quality of life. Um, but, you know, to me, it just also seemed like this very um, wistful idea that like, you know, the dilemma of kind of erasing your history and erasing like the things that you know my family have done for generations um and the dilemma of like how do we embrace tradition or how do we keep tradition but also embrace change to survive and i remember taking on a, i went on a walk with my grandpa and i asked him i was like do you feel like our family history has been erased and he took me to these plum trees outside of his village and he said those were planted by my grandfather and they're still here. Um, and no matter how different the landscape changes, no matter how many more factories pop up on our land, as long as those plum trees are still there, then, you know, so family history. Um, so that story kind of just stayed with me um, when I went back to America and, you know, went to started film school, went to college. Um, and yeah, I think it's just this also like internalized guilt that I have of never really seeking out that story about my family. It's always been there. I could have just asked and I never did. Um, and my dad is this very like stoic, quiet man who like never talks really about like that kind of thing. He never likes to really share how he actually feels. So I think Plum Town is also like my way of internalizing that guilt of like never truly wanting to connect with my family. And also kind of like that conversation, like what would it have looked like if my dad you know, um, went back to China and couldn't recognize what his, like, country, his uh, childhood home looked like, and that conversation that him and his father um, never had. So, yeah, it's kind of the inspiration behind Plum Town. Awesome, Kelly. Uh, appreciate that 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 background and and you know, I read a press release by you that that. Um, you know, that, that spoke to this, that our, our desire, we all have this kind of inclination of wherever we're, we're born, we're raised, we have this point of reference of what life is, and then we have this desire to, to, to move beyond that and find our own path. 
Uh, but there's also the, this this pull to just like you know our our heritage, our background is so important to to stay connected mm-hmm. with. So so have you seen any difference in your own personal life now after after making this short? And I know that you have a feature league script as well for to to to, to greater expand upon this story. But have you seen any behavioral changes in your in your own way of living with staying connected with your past? Yeah, totally. Um, I think like I, I spent my entire life growing up in New Orleans, like wanting to get away from home. Um, I'm like being an only child, being from um, I don't want to say like a small city because New Orleans is is such its like own thing. Um, but my entire life, I was like, I'm I want to be bigger than this. I want to be bigger than my hometown. I want to be better, you know, than than what uh, this sounds so terrible, but you know, like what my parents have settled for. Um, and now, you know, hometown was also me coming to terms with that realization that like I'm no nothing or I, I would be nowhere without the sacrifices of where I come from. Um, so honestly, it was as simple as like calling my mom more. You know, I think um, I, I think I took so much for granted. I took like my parents often like to me felt like very like suffocating love because being an only child, like all their attention is on me. And I was just like, stop. Like, that's why I wanted to get away. I wanted to go to college in another state. Um, But now, you know, it's calling my mom more. I was honestly like the biggest takeaway and really cherishing, I think, moments when I'm home and, and realizing like the, the, the motivations are like the, like the reason why my parents do what they do and say what they do, it's, it's all love. And it's all, you know, um, I think just that understanding and empathy of like (laughs) how family can be like so complicated, you know, but, um, the core of it is all just like love. I'll remember that term suffocating love. (laughs) I'm so terrible. (laughs) Well, the reason I'm an only child as well, and I have one child, so my my son, and and it's like, and I'm going to see these moments where it's like, okay, dad, too many hugs, too many kisses, whatever. I just like, dad, it's suffocating love. You're giving me suffocating love here. (laughs) Yeah. I think the best example is like, I I always had a curfew uh, and I all my friends didn't like, I think I remember I was so upset with my parents. Cause I'm like, Oh, you guys don't trust me. You know, like all my other friends, like their parents yeah, just like, yeah. are like stay as long out as long as you want. They go to bed. And I remember I had that conversation with my parents. I was like, you guys need to stop, like, trust me. And my parents were like, okay, that's fine. You don't have a curfew anymore. You got what you wanted, but, uh, we're not going to bed until we hear the door open and you come home. So you can stay out as long as you want, but, just know like we're going to be up and we're not going to bed until you come home. And I remember being so angry. I was like, that's so like manipulative. Like, you know, like I'm going to like start coming home earlier. Cause how can I like stay out knowing like the guilt that like my parents aren't going to bed. Um, but now that I'm older, it's like, obviously it's like you have one daughter she's out in the city like alone at night it's like as a parent like how can you consciously just be like okay i'm going to bed now you know it's like we'll see if she's back in the morning um so as i get older now it's like i i see the reasoning behind everything and as a kid i think you just get so caught up in your immediate feelings like oh i want to be out i don't want to have a crew you so i think yeah plum town really helped me come to terms with just like putting myself in my parents shoes or as the best of my ability you know as someone who's not a parent um but yeah, I've definitely, I think it was also um, my way of communicating to my parents all those thoughts, you know, and, and saying like, I understand now, like I understand why you guys raised me the way that you did. Um, and in, in Chinese culture too, like we don't really like to get in our feelings. We don't really like to like talk about that kind of thing. So um, yeah, the film was kind of like my chance at doing that. And I'm grateful for it because my lead actor uh, who plays the son, we, we, got really, we bonded a lot over that. He's also an only child with a very complicated relationship with his parents. And he was like, I want to use this film as my chance to say the things I've wanted to say to my parents and that we like, you know, don't really talk about. So yeah, I'm grateful Bring, for that. Bringing back a lot of memories here. All right. So, so let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's move along. So let's talk about uh, the financing. Oh, uh, for those of us joining on, uh, joining us on YouTube, if you would like to ask Kelly some questions, please do so within YouTube and we'll be able to see them here and try to get to uh, questions if we have any come through. So let's talk about financing. Uh, film financing, always a challenge uh, to, to get movies made. And so I know that you did... Uh, uh, tap into Kickstarter, and then mm-hmm. obviously you've gone, you know, the DCP route. And uh, so tell us a little bit about the financing journey and, and what it took and all the different options that you considered to financially uh, bring this story to life. Totally. 
<clears throat> yeah, so Plum Town, I think I was a sophomore uh, at USC at the time. And to me, it was actually my first, I consider it like my first like real short film. It wasn't a student film um, that had like no budget. Like for this, I was like, I want to do it right. I want to raise a sizable budget. And at that time, um, you know, like 20K, I think was like what we set our Kickstarter goal to. 20K to me at the time seemed so much. I was like, oh, this is so much money, um, which now is funny because it's so relative. Like it just gets more and more expensive. Um, and I think being a college student with like limited resources, Kickstarter was like the only route that I saw that could be possible. I think that's because um, all my other classmates and filmmakers my age, you know, they did Kickstarters. Um, and I've always loved the idea of, um, I think, tapping into your community and, and making film something bigger than just like your own personal project. Um, so that's what appealed to me about Kickstarter. And when I decided I was going to do it, everyone told me like, it is a full-time job. Like it's very, very hard. You have to be on it like constantly every day. And I think I, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I know that I'm prepared for that. But I, I didn't know like exactly how <laughs> hard it would be, which is that, you know, it's, it really is a full-time job. It's constant promotion. It's constant outreach. It's constant, like tapping into your network and your community. But then, you know, that only, that has its limit. And it's like, how can you package your film and your story in a way that appeals to strangers that you don't know. Um, so I kind of went on this like three, four month journey of um, doing, you know, social media outreach and, and LinkedIn outreach. And at that time, Clubhouse was a really big thing. I think it's kind of died out now. Um, so I would just go into like random Clubhouse rooms and participate in Q&As. And um, yeah, so it really was this uphill battle of trying to uh, reach the Kickstarter, uh, like the number that we had set. And Kickstarter, if you're not familiar, it's um, all or nothing. So you have, I think, 30 days to hit your goal. And if you don't, you don't get a single cent. Um, I think I we went that route because I think just like lighting a fire under, you know, it, it, it's like the motivation to really, really push it and, and make the goal. And I think at first I felt a little weird about it because for the longest time, like all the films that I've made have just been me and maybe a few classmates. Um, but now I was just involving all these people, so many people that I didn't even know. And I, I felt like I was maybe giving away like pieces of my personal story to other people. It felt weird, like, you know, kind of doing all these things for the promise of like a pledge. Um, but soon I realized like there was so much power in, in um, building this community. Um, we got to the point where we, right, we reached our goal, then we started shooting. And it was like all these people around the world cheering us on because they were so invested because they had, you know, donated and wanted to see it come to life. So um, we had like Kickstarter donors from like Australia that were like, today's like day one of Plum Town, like cheering you guys on. Um, and that felt really good. It felt like film wasn't this like insular, like, like thing that like, oh, only like, you know, the person making it can have. Um, it felt really good to really just open it up to the community of people who resonated with the story or, you know, wanted to support a young filmmaker. And that's an experience I'm, I'm so grateful for. All right. Great. Great. Yeah. I, I was unfamiliar with all those details of, of, of Kickstarter. And uh, so, so let's, let's segue that into, into the DCP. Um, mm -hmm. So, so went through DCP, you know, submitted your film for the for the short film award, and uh, we're the recipient again. Congratulations! So, so what does that Thank mean you. to you? What, what does that mean receiving that award? How does that help you know further your journey? Totally, um, yeah. So I, I'm so grateful for DCP. I was previously unfamiliar with it when I was uh, doing Palm Town like two years ago, which is crazy because time isn't real anymore. It's flying by so fast. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's one thing to make a film and get feedback from your friends and your collaborators, but it's one thing to have feedback from, you know, people like DCP who um, maybe filmmakers, maybe just um, 
people who like film um, and really just like putting it out there. Um, I think previously I'd either just shown it to like immediate friends or it had plays at film festivals, but you know, it's a large theater with a lot of people. You don't get to really just hear feedback like that. Um, so DCP, I think just it, it kind of demystifies, you know, the, the idea that also like film is not a singular thing, you know, it, it can involve so many people and, um, I think the feedback that you get from people who like are care, because if they don't care, then they're not going to take the time to watch it and to vote and to comment. So um, I think that was super valuable to me. It's like, oh, like for the first time, I'm not just kind of trying to get the approval or trying to get feedback from like festival juries or festival judges. Like these are actually like real peers. Like these are people that like I, I really want to know what they think. Um, so it was, it was great just like scrolling through the feedback and like reading people's comments and, you know, things to improve on and things that they liked. Um, so I think there's such with Hollywood, you know, there's such this um, idea that like, there are certain people up in the ranks that get to gatekeep, that get to like be the ones that tell you if a project is good or not, or if it's vi commercially viable or not. And they're these like shadowy, like mysterious figures, you know? And um, I think DCP really helps to break that down. And it's like, no, it's like the film industry is made out of real people who, you know, are all on their own path of, of filmmaking. And that's that's what is so powerful about, about the community. Excellent, excellent. Well. Let me throw up this way. It's kind of a long question. Mm -hmm. So what are your peers at USC using for crowdfunding? Why are they not on DCP? I'm, I'm curious about that piece. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there much awareness yeah. at, at the uh, at the film school level? Is there something you think DCP can do to reward young filmmakers to participate in crypto crowdfunding? So whatever yeah. you want to tackle there, it's a lot to digest, but whatever. <laughs> no, I'm reading it. Um, yeah, so first of all, um, I think my peers at USC, there's a lot of Kickstarter. Uh, but there's a lot of also like Indiegogo and Seed and Spark. And those are two other crowdfunding platforms that I think aren't like all or nothing. So whatever you raise is what you get. Um, so those are the popular ones. But I think um, DCP, and I think to my knowledge, it's like still fairly new. Um, and I think for me, I think people just aren't familiar with the idea behind it. Um, I think the idea of like Film3, Web3, Blockchain, Crypto, it's still like so new. Um, that I think honestly, education, education about it is is the best thing I think to raise awareness. Because I think um, after I submitted to DCP, I told a lot of, about it. I told my classmates about it, and now they're you know they have proposals on there, um, and they're like, wait, this is amazing. Like this is how I can get my short film funded because uh, I don't have the resources or access to you know people who will who will do it. Um, and yeah, I, I've never like told a friend about or a peer classmate about it. And they've been like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. It's just like, oh, I didn't know that existed. Or, you know, oh, I don't know how it works. Um, so I think it's just like education, you know, like involving um, universities or, or, or some sort of like, um, I don't know. It's like, yeah, educating people on, on what DCP is. And once it is, like, I, I can't see a reason why um, young filmmakers aren't on the platform. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Um, yeah. And I agree. I mean, I think that I think that we are still very, very new in this in this film three decentralized space. And um, and I really zeroed in on one of your comments earlier that, you know, whenever you're providing, you're submitting your materials. And I've heard this from other filmmakers, too. And whenever you're sending out your materials, you know, th there needs to be a trust element attached to it, that, mm -hmm. that someone's not going to just steal my work and run with my idea and produce their own content. And and um so, um, so as the platforms like decentralized pictures continue to mature, um, you know, I think it, trust is a, is a big element, and I think that you know having the right foundation in place um, will, will you know will make the difference in the long run. So mm -hmm. I'm curious. Yeah. So it, with your colleagues at that USC and other folks that you've worked with in the industry, um, are they are they familiar? With, with platforms like DCP or, or similar platforms? And have they, I mean, I know that we've said that it, we're at the front end here, but are they choosing to at least entertain the idea? Yeah, I think they're starting to. Um, I, I have so many classmates that are like, oh, we saw your DCP thing, like we looked into it and like, oh, we we're, we're submitting something. So I think, yeah, I think totally, like it's catching on and I think people are interested and I don't think it's ever a question of like, oh, I don't wanna do this. I think it's just like, 
oh, let me understand how it works. Like I had a friend that was like, I can't get my wallet. Like, how do I convert my money to like the thing? <laughs> yeah, the film credits. Working. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's just like once they get past that, like understanding and I, I'm still like learning more about it every day. Um, yeah. But once I think it like gets demystified in a way that it's like, oh, this is actually very simple. It's just, you know, um, the the normal like kind of process you go through to pitch your project, whether it's a Kickstarter, whether it's to an actual like person. Um, I think it's the, the the foundation is all the same. It's just like, can you accurately and authentically uh, pitch a project and get people interested in it? And that's the foundation of, I think, any aspect of filmmaking. You know, it's whether it's you're pitching to an exec or you're pitching to a peer or whether it's to the people on DCP. It's like, it's all the same. So I think once you, once they get past, I think the initial, like, what is this? You know, this is a really new thing. But I think with so many new things that are like innovative and new, it's like, once people understand it, once people catch on, then it's like, it's a no brainer of like, you know, being involved. But I think, especially with the film industry, like it's, for so long, there's been one system, you know, it's like the Hollywood system. Yeah, like, sure. this is what you do. This is, I, I had a um, class where a professor gave a, a lecture on like how to get a job in the industry. And he was like, he's older and um, was like a sitcom director. And he gave this whole passionate speech. He's like, what you do is you're going to get out of USC and you're going to be a PA and you're going to be the one that's like running coffee. Like I, nobody cares if you are a director. Nobody cares if you have a good script. It's like, we like back in the day, like had to do this. Like we ran coffee. We were like at the bottom, we worked our way up. And so like, that's what, that's how it still has to be for you guys. Um, and I, I like fundamentally disagree. I think it's like, if you have a voice, if you have a passion for it and you know what it takes to, you know, get your story out there, then do it. Um, and I think DCP, what I love about it is like, it represents that. It's like, if you are a filmmaker, then you're a filmmaker and, you know, put it out there. I don't feel like you have to like wait 10 years um, and be like, you know, I need to go through the Hollywood system. I need to be an intern. I need to PA. And then maybe somebody will like want to read my script or maybe someone will want to watch my, you know, pitch video. Um, so I like that DCP just kind of like allows that for everyone. Awesome. Awesome. So, so what's next for, for Plum Town? I know that this is adapted from a feature length screenplay. And actually, mm -hmm. I'll throw up a question right here. What's what's next now that you've won the award? What's yeah. on the horizon for the project? So, um, Plum Town, the short film, is kind of finishing up its festival run. We have a few more next in the new year, and then uh, it's premiering on Short of the Week, which is super exciting because Short of the Week is what I, uh, how I got into film. Uh, my like ninth grade film class, uh, my teacher would just put on Short of the Week, and that's you know I still throughout college would go on there for inspiration. So I'm super stoked about being on Short of the Week. Um, I think it'll be on there in like mid January. Um, and yeah, so Plum Town did start as a feature. It was the very first feature I wrote and I learned a lot from it. And it, you know, is set in China and is kind of this crazy thing about uh, <laughs> feuding Chinese farmers. I call it like Game of Thrones, but with like Chinese farmers who are like fighting each other for land and then have to unite when a land developer shows up and wants to take their land and they have to fight back. Um, but I'm actually, I think... Um, the as silly as it sounds like the political climate in china is so so complex especially with censorship um and i quickly learned that um i think i said it in china just to like create an authentic story and connection to my family but i'm actually i think adapting the feature into a different story um, that still has all the elements of it about like uh, land encroachment and you know um kind of urbanization versus tradition um, but just in like a different different format, I think that I would love to do one day um, and it's much more feasible. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing. And I'm developing another feature that I actually want to make first. Um, that yeah, so I think honestly, the biggest thing I learned through this process is like there's always a time and a place. There's a right time for everything. Um, just because Plum Town was the first feature I wrote doesn't mean it's the first feature I have to make. And sometimes the most personal stories the ones that are most important to you are the ones that, you know, you should put in the back burner and, and wait for like the right time. Um, and I, I think about that when I think about Plum Town the short too, because if I made it now, it would be a completely different film. And I, I've grown so much and I've learned so much. And um, I recently went to a Q&A with this director, 
Mikyatu Jisu, who uh, her feature won uh, best feature at Sundance. And she said it took her eight years to make her feature. Um, and she's grateful for that because in the eight years, she was able to really give it the best chance it had to to be what she wanted it to be, which was, you know, this really personal story. So um, yeah, I, I tell people like, oh, I'm not, you know, really interested in making Plumptown right now. And people are like, what? Like, why? You know, you have this traction with the short, but I think like, because it is so personal, because it's literally my family story, um, I want to give it the best shot that it has. <clears throat> and yeah, just take the time to, to really um, grow as a filmmaker and hopefully visit it one day. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it's, it's obvious that, you know, it, it takes time for some, some of these stories to mature and to, to mm -hmm. embrace, embrace that patience along the way. So, so great, great. I, I appreciate it, Kelly. Some, some, uh, great commentary, some great advice for aspiring filmmakers and, uh, sounds like you're well on your way. So, um, I'm done with the uh, core questions, but we have to leave with something fun. Not like everything that we've already done <laughs> hasn't been like a lot of fun. This has been a great interview. So this is Matt's speed round. So oh don't, gosh. don't over, <laughs> I know, don't overthink. I get that same response with, with every guest that I have on this I'm show. I'm so bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> so don't overthink. And so okay. just the, the first one or two words that come to mind. Okay. Don't overthink. Okay. Okay. Hopefully this is an easy warm up question. We'll see. <laughs> What's your favorite film? Ooh, uh, E.E. E. by Edward Yang, a uh, Taiwanese director. Um, it's like a three hour long movie. And the fact that I love it is a testament to it because I, you know, <laughs> if long you're going to make it three watch. hours, yeah, you got to love it. Yeah, it's it's captivating. It's it's the stunning like portrait of a family. Um, and I think I'm, family is like a theme that I, I visit with everything that I do. Um, so yeah, E.E., -E, it's Y-I-Y-I. -I -I. They're two separate words. Um, yeah, it's a, in Mandarin, and it's it's just a beautiful film. Okay, I'll have to check it out. All right, so you can only pick one. Writing or directing? Writing. Hmm. Okay. Why? Can I explain, or is it just... Yeah, yes? yeah. Um, <laughs> I think writing is the first form of directing in its purest form um, because a lot of people say like writers shouldn't direct on page, but I think I don't believe in that because I think just by the intention of, of a story and deciding to put it on paper, that's directing. Um, and to me, I think the idea that you can just create something out of nothing or draw upon, you know, real life stories or real life experiences and put that on page. Um, to me, I think that's, the part of filmmaking that's where filmmaking begins um and i think feature writers especially <laughs> would agree um and i think it's yeah it's just the most pure distilled form of, of uh storytelling um and i truly think the the best advice i got from a mentor is like if you want to direct then you need to write because writing is the first form of directing Okay, so assuming you're successful in writing and you move into the place where you're able to direct, what's yeah. the hardest part of directing? Um, I think communicating, communicating the vision. Um, and yeah, I think just in, like having a vision in your head, but how you communicate it, whether it's verbally or whether it's through all the different departments and different mediums. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the, the hardest part. Okay. Last question. What influenced you to be a filmmaker? Probably going to need more just, than one or two words here. <laughs> I was like, I think <laughs> being, being a child, which I know I couldn't control. I had no say in. Um, uh -huh. It just, it was... Uh, yeah, I think being an only child I, is why I became a filmmaker. Um, I think grappling with one, like extreme chronic boredom growing up. Um, and I think like just the idea that stories are like where you could escape to when you want, you know, a different life and you want, this sounds so, it makes me seem like I was I had a terrible upbringing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think just the idea that um, you can create all these different stories in your head um, and bring them to life and, and live in the stories. Um, and become different people and experience different things. 
Excellent. Well, Kelly, this was a real pleasure to, to have you on the Talent Cast. And congratulations again on winning the DCP Short Film Award. And um, can't wait to, uh, you know, obviously I'm going to have to be patient because you said, you know, we want to make sure it's the right time to do the full <laughs> version of this film. So I yeah. will be patient. I, I want to see it today, of course, but I w- I'll be patient <laughs> to see the feature length of, of Plum Town. So, so uh, congratulations you. to you again um, on all your co- accomplishments today and look forward to, to watching your, uh, your, your career move forward. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you to DCP for everything. Okay. All right. We'll see you around. And thanks again, Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.